You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. Hi, I'm Jennifer Wood. And I'm Jennifer Connor. From Equestrian Businesswomen, and you're listening to Equestrian B2B, the podcast that brings together industry leaders, entrepreneurs, and equestrians for conversations about how they build and sustain a successful business. On today's show, we speak with equestrian legend, Lyndon Gray, about her life of learning and horses. Born in Maine, Lyndon Gray rode her first horse with her mother before she could walk. She grew up riding Western, hunt seat, bareback, playing Gymkhana games, driving, and generally enjoying horses. Pony Club built a foundation of both solid riding basics and proper horse care that guides Lyndon to this day. She became a successful event rider and trained for two years with the Olympic three-day team. It was when Lyndon started to specialize in dressage at age 27 that Seldom Seen, the first of her famous dressage ponies, came into her life and took her to the Grand Prix level. Although Lyndon rode warm bloods for her participation on two Olympic teams in 1980 and 1988, the World Championships and World Cup final, her ponies held a special place in her heart. Generous, outspoken, and pragmatic, London has devoted her energies to the improvement of all riders, not just the privileged ones, and all horses, even the littlest ones, with the goal that all youths might learn how to become not just better riders, but all-around horsemen. She established London's Youth Dressage Festival in 1999. With the formation of the Youth Dressage Festival, came the creation of the organization Dressage for Kids, a full-fledged nonprofit operating the YDF, the Weekend Equestrian Program, pony-only clinics, and the East Coast Dressage Pony Cup, D4K, offers scholarships for every sort of dressage rider. Graduating valedictorian from Fox Hollow School, she studied Greek and Latin at Sweetbriar College while taking summer courses in archaeology at Stanford. She has taught clinics all over the world and trained national champion riders. Lendon received the 1989 Governor's Award from the Maine Sports Hall of Fame, the title of USPC legend, and was inducted into the Sweetbriar College Sports Hall of Fame. Lendon wrote a very popular book, Lessons with Lendon, that helps make dressage more accessible and understandable to all riders. Hi, Lendon. It's great to have you here today. Um, we've been wanting to talk to you for a while, so I'm really glad that we could organize a time. Well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Um, so kind of just starting out, knowing your um, experience and time in the industry, what do you think is so the most significant the change with, that find you've the seen in today's guest um, in the show notes at www.eqbusinesswomen.com? I think there's a, there's the a few B2B things. B2B first of all, a month on the first and the fifteenth. It's just gotten. So you can that, find out more at you know, eqbusinesswomen.com and follow us on get Facebook started, which and is Instagram. How I did. You know, I find Equestrian B2B nowhere Maine, wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to follow, subscribe, and leave a review. That's both you can have all 20 plus shows and the loss of the Horse land. Radio Network with you uh, wherever you, you know, go it's, with their it's free app for iPhone so many people and Android. That can, can have a go to your app store and search Horse Radio Network. Now, so go that, give someone the an opportunity. Hand, I think is making a, a big difference. And the other thing that I find um, in the competition world is the incredible emphasis on awards. Um, and I'm speaking, you know, I know the dressage world particularly, mm -hmm. specifically. Uh, I can't speak for, for other disciplines, but... But we used to show because it was down the road or it was a little fun or it just seemed like a good time. <clears throat> Whereas now I see so much, you know, I have to get my bronze medal. I have to qualify for, you know, young riders. I have to qualify for regional championships. And and it isn't that we're necessarily showing when we should be or mm. showing uh, at the right time for the horse. Um, I showed so much just because, I mean, in the beginning I was showing specifically, I just wanted to see what somebody else thought about what I was doing. Right. You know, right. Someone mm -hmm. else's opinion. Am I on the right track? Um, and, um, uh, now there's just such pressure, I think, 
um, to get your bronze, silver, gold medal to, again, qualify for something. Yeah. And um, it takes some of the fun out of it, I think. And it puts a lot of pressure on horses that doesn't necessarily need to be there. Yeah, I definitely see that in the hunter jumper world as well, where mm-hmm. you can find a show to go to every week of the year. And there are so many trainers and kids and amateurs that are never home to practice. They're just at yeah. shows all the time. So, how do you? I don't know. I don't see how you improve or how you really gain a relationship with your horse when you're constantly under that pressure environment of competition. Exactly. Um, Yeah. And we used to, you know, again, living in Maine and the Northeast, we sort of had a three month show season at the most four. And I always look forward to the last show of the season, which was usually September because mm-hmm. now I had a whole winter of schooling and no, not even a dream of going out to compete. Yeah. And a lot of people are now, and I know this is very much in the hunter jumper world, but even in the dressage world, a lot of people are competing basically year round or have a very, very short time either to give their horses some downtime or just to focus on making your horse better working, you know, schooling it without I have to have it ready for whatever yeah and the land issue that you mentioned is really interesting too I grew up outside of Chicago uh, and the barns that I rode at were hunter jumper trainers at polo barns so Mm. there was a ton of land and I it was starting like right as I was kind of aging out and going to college um that you know all the subdivisions were getting built around it and now they're just gone and exactly it's um i know it's not a regional thing it's a national thing and yeah it's it's sad and uh that's why i applaud all the people who are working so hard to keep open land and right whether it's for horses or not Mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I'm up, I'm shocked actually at how many. And again, I work mostly now with kids, but how mm-hmm. many kids come to some of my programs? And I'll say, why don't you take him for a walk around the fields, or you know, heaven forbid, a trail ride? And they're terrified to get out of the ring. I mean, these oh, are yeah. perfectly good riders on perfectly nice horses. And every year in my winter program, I have at least one who tells me her his or her horse cannot hack. <laughs> um, even though it's just down the long driveway, right. and that's that's really scary to me. Well, we had a we have a friend who was in California, and she was talking about somebody she knew, and that's basically what this woman's job was to go to all the different barns, and she would trail ride people's horses. <sighs> She she would just get on one after the other, the other, and yeah. because these women didn't want to go out, they didn't want to leave the ring, but they understood that the horses probably needed to. So she, that was her job. She'd That's and she'd show up at these great barns, get a leg up, <laughs> go around. I'm like, this is my dream job, actually. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to add that to my list of possible jobs. For yes. People. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. and important. I mean, yeah, yeah. I know. I I grew up on a farm where uh, we had horses all over the place. My dad's a standard bred trainer. He grew up in Maine. He tells stories Mm. about riding his pony to the fair to compete in you know shows and um, then you know. So we grew up in that environment of having a farm and uh, lots of ponies and definitely. Uh, short show season and my mom would take us and we would pull up in the little two horse and do a little walk trot and then not far from our house um, and I never imagined that it would evolve into the competitions that it is today sure no. well I in Maine we would you know I had my first horse was a was a oversized pony and then I well I had two sort of oversized ponies for quite a while and we would go to a show and you would show English equitation and Western equitation and open jumpers, which was a few bamboo poles on something. <laughs> and we drove them. I mean, we did everything, you know, yeah. you sort of cool. pole bending. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. We, we same. I grew up driving everything. And I did 4-H a little bit. I did a lot of pony club, but we did 4-H and I had a, a Connemara pony that we did. Um, 
I was like third in barrel racing and first in dressage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, so it's changed a lot. <laughs> yeah, it sure has. And what do you think is had the biggest impact on how you've developed yourself and, and your business over the years? Well, I've been doing this a very long time, probably been basically a professional for about 60 years. Um, and I've, I've gone through various stages. Mm. Um, and I have to say nowadays I emphasize with the kids that I work with and Again, I work mostly with kids, but everybody, you know, what are your goals? What's your plan? You know, what's your short-term goal? What's your long-term goal? And I have to laugh at myself because I never had them. One yeah. thing just kind of led to another. Certainly, I two things heavily influenced me early on. One was Pony Club. Pony Club was, my mother started a Pony Club in 1956 when I was seven. And, and um, that was our life, you know, through you know, my eventing career. And even afterwards, I was an examiner and various things in Pony Club. Um, and then another thing that I did, which certainly wasn't a plan, I went to Sweet Bar College in Virginia, which is was a very, very strong hunter program, especially back yeah. then. It had an excellent system under Paul Cronin, and he was about as anti-dressage as you can get. I was basically still an event rider. And I mean, truly, he saw he thought it was a terrible thing. But I put myself into the program and and four years of, of working under him. And then I taught there for three years, three and a half years afterwards. And it had a huge impact on the way I developed as a dressage rider after that. Hmm. Um, the ability to go with a horse and the ability to kind of do nothing and leave it alone and not get in its way um, and all of that. That's a little off subject. I don't know how I did that. But, That's a, um, interesting still. <laughs> um, but truly with me, it was, I had no major plan. Um, it just, I was, you know, I started teaching and breaking horses. My first real business in Maine was breaking horses and, and uh, um, so forth. And and then I went to college where I studied Greek and Latin, which has been phenomenally useful, of course, um, <laughs> in no way. Um, and then my senior year, they offered me a job teaching and then I was done teaching. And I was literally within a couple of days of getting my car, getting in my car and driving home <clears throat> with my horse. And <clears throat> I got offered a job in Alabama. Uh, center of the dressage world right Not. um and that's where mrs whitehurst uh who offered me the job i took it and i was breaking her horses and starting her horses that she bred and that got me to seldom seen who got me a lot of publicity and then i rode a bunch of her horses in my first national championship and and then golly gee i'm doing dressage now i'm in my mid-20s instead of eventing and maybe i should learn about this so i bought an old horse to learn some upper level dressage and literally one thing led to another. And I, mm -hmm. I got my first Olympic horse because of something I said during a, a pizza supper during a clinic in, in Alabama and somebody <clears throat> appreciated what I said. And I wasn't, I mean, I was just spouting off. Um, <laughs> and the next thing I knew he called me and offered me this horse with the understanding I'd try out for the world championships that year. I'd never seen a live Grand Prix test. They weren't been, um, so truly, literally, one thing led to another. I, I was never the kid, you know, everybody wants to grow up and go to the Olympics. Never crossed my mind. I was a kid in Maine. I didn't have the finances. I, you know, whatever. Yeah, so yeah. it was very much, first of all, luck being in the right place at the right time, but also being prepared to take any opportunity. Yeah. Um, one of the hardest decisions was leaving Maine. Um, as my business grew and, uh, literally it got to where almost all of my clientele was from out of state, but that was a huge step to leave home. Literally, right. um, yeah. the family had built a facility. So, um, you know, I wish I could say that it was, you know, I sat down and I wrote down the pros and the cons and this is what I wanted, you know, nah, 
I just, I just was willing to take opportunities and going back to what I said in the beginning, I think in many cases, these opportunities came to me because I didn't have this major competitive goal. I mean, who would go to Buell, Alabama, if you wanted to go to the Olympics? Nobody. <laughs> um, but that was truly what gave me the opportunities. Um, and so that was my approach. Just yeah. If it looks like it might be fun, useful, that I could at least put food on the table, um, I did that. Yeah. So did you feel like it flew, it, the flow was pretty easy from transitioning through all your, throughout your life, through all your different roles? Um, well, again, you know, I rode, I've ended I did decently. I got to Mrs. Whitehurst and she gave me opportunities, uh, one of which led to another. At that point, I would have said, you know, my emphasis was on riding and training, um, uh, but it was a, a sort of a two roads there. One, it became, you know, as a, as the horses came into my life that were good, I had to be serious about the competitive part of it. But truly what got me up every morning was taking any horse and making it better. I loved the training. I loved the the challenge, figuring out how do I help this horse understand what I want. And I didn't care if it was going to be a competitive horse. I just love taking that horse and, and using dressage sort of therapeutically in some cases right, um, right. to strengthen, to supple, to help with soundness uh, or just to make a horse where the owner could take it home and, and enjoy it. And because competition wasn't the thing for me, I think it helped me not burn out. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, when you compete year after year, you have years where you're really successful. And then the next year, sort of nothing works. And it it's, would be so easy to get discouraged at that time. And um, but the rest of it carried me through the comp. The competition was kind of, to me, a necessary evil. That's a little too strong. But but I needed to, to for publicity. I needed, you know, if I was going to get clients, they had to know who I was. Um, I was supplied with horses that the owners wanted to be competitive. So, of course, I had to keep that going. But if that was all I had, I might have burned out. Mm -hmm. But I had the other approach, which which kept me up in the morning. And then from taking any horse and making it better as I, you know, as I wanted to sort of transit a little bit away from so much competing then it was taking any rider and making it better mm -hmm. making him or her better not it i guess um mm -hmm. and uh um so you know i had a, a definite period of transition here once after i'd moved to new york um where i was i was teaching more and riding less uh until gradually i wasn't riding at all was yeah. that a struggle at all to give up the riding? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> it really wasn't. I got to the point in the in the competing where it wasn't fun anymore. Mm -hmm. Um it was just not I mean there was the pressure from the owners to do well and there was the pressure too, you know, after I'd done my first I I was first of all make it clear uh and something you wrote. I was on two Olympic teams but I did not go to two Olympics. Because yeah. I was on the Olympic team in 1980, uh, where when Russia invaded Afghanistan and, and basically most countries boycotted the Olympics. We had an alternate Olympics in England. But um, right then, after I'd, I'd been successful, um, then every time I'd see sort of someone that wasn't full time in my life, oh, what have you got? What, what have you got for the next Olympics? What have you got for the next, you know, world championships? You know, they were, is that horse going to make it? You know, right. those were the questions I got all the time. And um, and that's fine. But um, as I say, that wasn't what got me up in the morning. And the time came, you know, one of the big questions we're asked a lot is, how do you deal with nerves when you compete? Well, nerves get in your way in the beginning, and then nerves help you. 
once yeah. you get over the bad part of it because you need to be a little on edge. You need to be, it gives you that trying a little harder. And then it kind of got to where I, I didn't care. Yeah, You know, I went in the show ring and yeah, I did my best, but it, I didn't have that. Oh, I got to get this really, really to work. And that's not good. That's yeah. not good. And that's when I really started to transit more into the, the teaching. And then I started getting nervous at competitions for my students. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but not, not so much for me. Yeah. And I love that shows. And especially when you're working with so many kids that uh, it's not going to be the same. You're not going to do the same thing probably for the rest of your life. And mm -hmm. very few people do. And being able to recognize things and be self-aware and say, you know, I don't yes. like competing anymore. I need to figure out something else yep. to do or what makes me happy and what am I good at? Um, that's a really great example, I think, for kids to know and, and understand and be able to recognize in themselves as they go through the sport. Yeah. It's a tough sport to be in. It's a tough business to be it in, is. no matter what direction you kind of go in. And I have to say, I had lots and lots of working students when I was in New York. I'd have, you know, sometimes as many as eight at a time. And the ones that, that were there for a few weeks or a few months or six months or something, and then would come to me and say, you know, I don't want to be doing this the rest of my life. <laughs> and I would say, yes, thank goodness you figured that out now. <laughs> yeah. I felt I was doing as much a service to them as those that I was able to direct into a, a you know, a successful riding career. Uh, let's find that out now when there are more choices mm -hmm. of other yeah. things to do. Yeah. And that's that is very important. I recognized that when I was younger, I decided I didn't want to be around the racetrack and mm -hmm. I didn't want to be training horses. And I I went into more of the breeding farm and then I got real tired of that after 12 years and said, I need something else. And now I'm in pharmaceutical sales, work for an <laughs> equine company and I yeah. prefer this. I like I like that. But yeah, it's a real lifestyle that you have to embrace to stay in the mm -hmm. horse industry. And it can be a it's, it could be a rough life. <laughs> Yeah. And as you've discovered, there's lots of different ways to still have have your fingers in the the horse industry. But but uh, as we say, have a real job. Yeah. And I, I have to be honest, I have currently I have two Welsh ponies and uh, I like being an owner. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually embracing that and enjoying that. And I haven't ridden in a while, had a young thoroughbred. It didn't work out. And I'm like, you know what? I, I like the role as owner. Like, uh -huh. this is nice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I was just talking to someone last night and we were saying how long it's been since we've ridden regularly and mm -hmm. neither of us miss it at all. Mm -hmm. The the riding part. I miss the horses and you know, being around mm -hmm. them and working around them during the day and uh, you know what they can bring to your life. Sure. But the riding They're special part. creatures. Yeah, exactly. And I have to say I went to Europe long ago uh, when I was riding. And the first thing, the first time I went to Europe to compete, which was in 1978, we went over for the world championships. The thing that struck me, because at that point, Germany was everything in the dressage world. You know, right. every, the Germans were fabulous and, and other Europeans as well. And, uh, you know, we had them up on this pedestal. And I was horrified at the really bad riding I saw in Germany, in Europe. <laughs> I mean, they were the wonderful ones, but there were those that were worse than our average ones. And that was a, that was a, a real sort of revelation to me because I had thought everything European was fabulous. Um, and then um, going to Australia and New Zealand, um, I think the thing that struck me there which I think, I, I don't know if it's still like that completely. I know it is somewhat, is how they let their horses be horses, mm. you know. And I'm not, I don't know that nowadays they're top international horses like this, but they all lived out, you know, yeah. and they they uh, uh, weren't babied 
the way our horses were. Um, one thing that struck me in um, Iceland, for example, um, I was I was invited over there to work with the sort of Icelandic society to see if dressage would be useful. Uh, it really isn't for what the Icelandic horses do, I don't think. <laughs> but in Iceland, and then I went several years, I was invited to Uruguay, of mm-hmm. all places, to work with their top riders who were military. Yeah. And And again, this is a long time ago, so things may have changed in both places. But a little bit that horses are a little more commodities. Yes. And a yes. little cold-bloodedness about it. I remember the top Uruguay rider and this, they were preparing for the Pan American games. I was, you know, talking to him and, and uh, cause they were part of the, I mean, I did clinics down there and um, I said something about, you know, planning ahead of, you know, your, your training sessions and when you're going to give the horse a little break and so forth. And he interrupted me and he said um, something about, uh, what did I said? Something about uh, giving her a rest. He's a mayor. And he said, she can rest when she's dead. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fine. So, um, I wasn't interested in horsemanship. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there is, I think, still out there in some places, uh, horses are important, um, hmm. but they are definitely a little more of a commodity um, and uh, expendable. And let's face it, look at our our racing thoroughbreds, you know. I mean, to pick on them, not just them. Mm. You know, it doesn't run fast enough. Off it goes to the auction for mm. a horrible truck to Canada or whatever. Yeah, yeah, there. I think a, a lot of places in the world still consider them basically livestock, and we've really mm-hmm. started to embrace them more as pets. Yeah. You know? yeah. What do you think makes somebody a prospect to go to the Olympics? Well, boy, is it different. I mean, I was on the team in 80 and then went also to the 1988 Olympics. Um, and in both cases, well, in 1980, basically, there were 12 people in the country that could do a Grand Prix test, literally. Yeah. So uh, yeah. we were all invited to the trials and uh, a little bit more more competitive in 1988. But it's so much more competitive nowadays. And let's face it. Again, going back to our very first discussion about how money has changed. I mean, mm-hmm. the, my, the horses, the two horses that I rode uh, on Olympic teams wouldn't even be looked at nowadays. You know, the quality mm-hmm. of horse. The, and the expense and look at the sort of trouble in one way we got into this year um, by, you know, horses, top horses, very good horses were bought the very, very good horses, but did they have the partnership developed in time? Um, But even nowadays to buy the young horse puts a lot of people out of it. And I'm saying to people, you know, I t- talk to people a lot. This is a slightly off subject, but I talk to people a lot about, you know, with whom they're going to train. You know, if they're going to, you know, kids will call me. I'm moving to this area. I'm going to college in this area. And everybody wants to train with a big name. But there are so many really, really good people out there that just haven't had the opportunity. They yeah. haven't had the luck of having the horse, or maybe they had a wonderful horse that went lame or, you know, they, there's so much luck involved. Do you have the horse in order to have the horse? Do you have the right sponsor? Are you able to get the right, the right training? I mean, can you go to where you can get the training and competing or do you have to stay home for your job or your family Mm -hmm. or whatever? I mean, there's, there's so much that goes into who's going to make an Olympic team. And the other thing I tell people, kids particularly, all the time, you know, yes, you want to go to the Olympics. That's three people every four years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there are not many Olympians. And let's look at it nowadays. Yeah. You've (laughs) got got several people who have the sponsors that are going to make sure they have the horse. 
And yeah. to be someone like a Laura Graves, who I, you know, admire so much, who bought this horse as a three-year-old, and she fucked her off and broke her back and this and that, and <laughs> and she stuck with it, perhaps partly because she couldn't sell it, um, and came out of nowhere, so to speak, uh, to make our team and be one of the best in the world. Um, yeah. And um, we need more people. But, you know, the discussion that goes on now okay, we buy the young horse, we try to develop ourselves, but even the expense of developing a four, five, six-year-old and keeping it going, I mean, most of our Olympic horses are, you know, 10 to 12 to 14 years old. That's a long, long, long road. Does that yeah. discover, did that answer your question at all? I think I've started yeah. one. <laughs> yes. No, that, 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 nope, that's exactly what I wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's, uh, so many people say the Olympics is their dream and yeah, you never want to shut down people's dreams, but exactly. Boy, is it let's be realistic. Hard. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I have to be honest. And I think I've said this before on the podcast, when I was younger, it was never my goal to the, to go to the Olympics. Like I, I, I guess I kind of understood what it would take to get there. And I love riding, but I just don't think I was willing to put in the work that I knew it was going to mm-hmm. take yeah. And I find that nowadays I, I do mostly clinics, um, two day clinics. You know, I have a three month mm-hmm. program in Florida and one month program in, in Michigan. But but um, kids and again, I'm working with kids mostly. Don't have a sense of how what hard work is. Yeah. What focus in your riding? Are you doing every you you have these dreams are you doing everything you can to make it to, to get the most out of, are you taking notes after every lesson? Mm -hmm. Are you making sure that every lesson you get is a new lesson? Or are you, you know, they fill out goal sheets. And my favorite question on it is what have you been working on all year that you should have fixed by now? Mm -hmm. You know, are you letting your instructor say the same thing to you over and over and over again? (laughs) Um, you know, are you reading? Are you talking to the vet? Are you learning about how to keep your horse the best you can keep it? And it's not just getting on and having a lesson or getting on and riding 1,800, 20-meter circles or something. <laughs> um, there, There's, I mean, people are talking all the time, not just in the horse world, you know, about the lack of, of a work ethic and mm. many, many people. And, and I'm not saying everybody's like this, but I see a lot. They have these great dreams, but, but, you know, they kind of get on the horse and ride it and get off and leave it. Um, yeah. Kind of thing. And at that level, honestly, riding's a small part of it. I mean, exactly. It's everything around it yeah. that you need to know. And I was talking to Laura Kraut um, a few weeks ago and she's started kind of a mentoring program uh-huh. Or someone that uh, a young rider that she's working with, and that's what we she told me is you know so many riders are incredibly talented on the back of a horse, and they know nothing about how to keep the horse sound or how to manage it or how to run a program that will you know keep them in horses coming up and how to bring along young horses so that. Um, you're not always having to buy ready-made ones and exactly. there's or, or, just so much more. Yeah. Than... I mean, even, even down to being able to look at a horse and yes. see beyond, you know, the, the flashy coat or if it's, if it's clipped or whatever, like look at its feet, <laughs> look at its confirmation, sure. look at yes. its movement, you know, like I, yeah. I'm, I don't know. I listen, I, have stalked grade one winners at the racetrack before because I've watched it gallop across the turf. And I was like, Oh my God, who is that horse? Look at the way it moves. It's absolutely stunning. And I've gone back to the barn and looked it up, like found it because I just need to know, you know, and then, then you look it up and it's a grade one winner. And I'm like, okay, I think I have pretty good taste in horses, (laughs) you know, same thing. I mean, my two Welsh ponies, one of them is just absolutely insanely stunning. And you know, it's, I, I've stalked her. I stalked her since she was a yearling. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I did a lot of 
breeding in 4-H where, you know, we and Pony Club where we had to look at confirmation of horses and had to look at feet. And I also spent a lot of time at standard bread sales with my dad going over horses and looking at the way they moved. And uh, I think that that's an important part of it. Yeah. And, and another thing, along with the, the stable management part of it, whatever you want to call it, is how to train a horse. Mm-hmm. As you know, what do you focus on today? When do you just ride it for 10 minutes? When do you ride it for longer? What are you thinking about the fitness of the horse? It isn't just getting on and practicing your shoulder in 82 times, or I'm exaggerating, obviously, uh, <laughs> yeah. or something like that, but how to develop a horse. And nowadays, at least in the dressage world, I mean, when you look at our top riders, most of them grew up started out either as working students or as grooms for top people. And there are few and fewer people that are willing to be working students. They want to go and immediately be paid a nice salary or immediately be riding their good horses. And they're not willing to put in that grunt work that most of us did so that we really learned about the in the stable and also the development as a trainer. Yeah. Riding bad horses teaches you a lot more than riding the good ones. Sure does. (laughs) Oh yeah. (laughs) Lots of bad horses, but, uh, and, and I love, um, the dressage for kids program that you started. And I know, you know, we've had, connections um with that at global dressage festival and and everything that you have done with that nonprofit um was it a need that you saw should be filled in the industry and is that why you started it i started it basically and and i was as guilty as anyone i would it it came into my head mostly Well, first of all, I have to tell you, in 1988, when I went to the Olympics, I had some people that financially helped me. And what I gave back to them was a journal. I did a daily journal from the time we went, the horses went into quarantine until we we got home after the Olympics. And I wrote it. It's all handwritten and uh, never looked at it again. Well, I was cleaning out and I came across it the other day, last summer. And um, I gave it to a friend of mine. To, I said, you want to read this? And she said, yes, I didn't read it. And she, at one point, she, she called me and said, do you know you wrote this? And so in 1988, and I have no recollection of doing it at all, <laughs> I wrote a, a whole little blurb after watching the training over there. That, and uh, this was in Seoul, Korea, um, and talking to riders. Anyway, that we didn't have a program in the U.S., to develop our riders, you know, and, and when you thought about the way the gymnasts started out and the, the track people and the swimmers and so forth. So I had all, somehow that was in the back of my head, huh. but going to the North American young rider championships year after year, what I saw so often, it's a little bit what we've already talked about is a horse would be bought for a young rider and they would be taught to ride that horse in those tests. Yeah. And that was the extent of it. And I was as guilty as anybody. I don't mean to sound, you know, whatever. Um, and again, what we we're talking about, the lack of of knowledge on the ground and so on and so forth. So that that bugged me. And um, so in 1998, I went to a good friend of mine, client at the time, Fern Feldman. And I said, what do you think about this idea? And it started as a show. And the show was, our first one was in 1999. Um, The show was equal three parts dressage test, where, of course, the horse helps, (laughs) you know, that you have a nice quality horse. Uh, A group equitation, which was not so much equitation, wasn't part of the dressage world then, Mm -hmm. um, particularly. And um, where, of course, oh, yeah, it helps to have a nice horse, but the riders judge. And then a written test on assigned reading. And of course, every year the reading was different. And of course, uh, the horse doesn't help at all there. So it was my effort to level the playing field. And then literally, 
and we still have our show. We just we're on our 25th anniversary this year. Um, everything that was built from that just came. Well, we made a little money at the show. What are we going to do with our money? So we started having having uh, scholarships offering, and then then we had some kids at whatever. What can we do in the winter up here in New England? So we started a a two day what we called at the time the weekend educational program, which was two days of all kinds of lectures. We we rented a school and had all kind. You know, we had five or six rooms going at a time lectures. For anybody and everybody, from parents to trainers to judges to, you know, those that are, you know, just trail riding to whatever. And then, again, one thing led to another, led to another. Um, And I feel that dressage for kids, as I look at it now, we kind of fill, try to fill in some of the holes. Mm -hmm. For example, why do most people teach? They teach because they rode fairly well. Do they know anything about teaching? Not any more than what the way they were taught, which might not have been so, you know, such quality teaching. So we started the, what we call T for T, training for teaching, which is not so much about what to teach, but how to teach. Yeah. Because Mm -hmm. I know myself, man, did I teach badly for a long time. You know, I just, I never thought about it. You know, I just spewed things and uh, we get frustrated in this and that and to really stop and think about how you're teaching and learn about um, methods of teaching uh, not just the theory of riding of of riding and training so that's become really a very popular program and then yeah uh, actually it was Kim Kim Van Camp and now Kim Crook who I was talking about you know, wishing where I could do more than the clinics. And she said, she set it up so that I could do the winter intensive training program three months with, you know, anywhere from 12 to 15 kids in Florida. And that's where you can really make a difference. Mm-hmm. And again, it's not just the lessons, but the stable management, they have a lecture every day. They do fitness every day, um, trying to develop the whole rider. So one thing, again, it was like, what if, would this help? Let's try doing it. And I think the the big plus of dressage for kids under un, unlike some of the other big organizations is we're small enough that we have an idea. Let's just do it. We don't have to right. go through this committee and that committee and that board. We just, we just do it. So um, yeah, I hope at one point, not too long ago, I, I thought, you know, if, if I wrap myself around a tree or whatever, um, Massage for kids will probably dissipate, but I've been informed that that can't happen. And uh, so we're trying to set it up so that it can go on for a long time. Yeah, I hope so. After me, I hope. Do you have any idea how many kids have gone through your program? Oh, my goodness. I, I don't. I mean, we have those that just do the clinics. Right. Um, some of them won. I have I have one girl. We now go up to age 25. And I have one girl who just graduated out in Texas who had done 25 different D for K educational programs wow. over the years. Um, so, you know, we have those that, that really we've made a profound difference in their lives. Um, but um you know, we're probably in the educational, in the riding clinics, educational programs. We've got at least 250 a year. Uh, mm-hmm. there, there are those that, again, do several years. And then we have have uh, our Zoom lectures. And that's kids and adults. Um, and the show, which has anywhere from 100 to 300 plus kids a year. Wow. So I have no idea, but yeah, it, and it was a originally <laughs> very much northeast, but now it's yeah. it's totally national. That's um, what I love too is that you're really getting to areas where they kids don't have any opportunities. Like there's no showing dressage, yeah, big showing dressage opportunities in in lots of the country, um, and that's I think you can find some really interesting kids and horses oh, we've had, in those places. Yeah. 
And it's not, it, you know, for the clinics, any level is welcome. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of fun because sometimes I'll have those that have no idea about putting a horse on the aids, you know, and at the same clinic, I'll have somebody doing Grand Prix. Right. And um, we've had, you know, it's, we don't in any way look for, I mean, we had a clinic with a, a rider with Down syndrome mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago. I've had a, quite a few autistic kids, not that, you know, they've got to be able to sort of be part of a lesson, but, um, you know, I don't care what they're riding as long as it's basically sound and mm-hmm. uh, uh, what level. And, I, you know, the one thing that I ask if you're part of one of our clinics is that you want to be the best you can be. That's what I always tell them. I don't care if you're going to be the queen of training level. Right. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. You don't have to have great ambition to to go to the Olympics. We talked right. about. But that you you want to work hard at it. That's all I yeah. ask. That Improve not... in yeah. any way that you can. Absolutely. Yeah. What's the most common piece of advice that you give to young adults? <laughs> Find a way to love what you're doing mm-hmm. and appreciate You know, one thing I'm saying to kids all the time, aren't horses amazing? You know, look at what they do for us. Yeah, truly. And, you know, whether it's jumping a big jump or just doing 45 20 meter circles Mm -hmm. a day, (laughs) you know, Um, and, and I, you know, zebras supposedly are pretty much untrainable. Yeah, I think, but a little bit like dogs and cats. You know, <laughs> cats are fairly untrainable, like to be around us, but but um, to really appreciate that horse because if you really appreciate what he's doing for you in so many ways, I think it'll help you be a better rider. Yes, and yeah, yeah, it is when you sit and think about. <laughs> Yeah. what we make courses do and exactly. that they're like sure all yeah. right <laughs> yeah and we squash them in a stall and uh-huh. we, you know i mean it's i'm just mm-hmm. i'm in you know every year i'm more in awe of horses yeah i i have a retired standard bread he made 1.4 million dollars on the track and uh-huh. they were looking for a home and i took him from one of my friends and i mean you could ask him to jump a table and he'd be like all right well, yeah. I'll give it a try. I mean, yeah. I might pace up to it. It might look yeah. awful, but yeah. I'll do it. It's fine. You know, <laughs> and I just, yeah. and he was also one of those horses that never lunged him, could sit for months. I had ACL surgery, came back, rode yeah. him, no problem. Never, you know, didn't lunge him. And I was like, you know what? There's something to be said for horses that, you know, like, and there's so many that just like, okay, you want to get on me today? Fine. That's fine. Okay. Mm-hmm. Haven't ridden me in a week. Okay. Put and I think in my mouth, like yeah. put yeah. it tight in a Goose girth on, on my stomach. Yeah. Like I can't, I hate wearing pants without elastic waistbands <laughs> and <laughs> we're like right. cinching up girths on horses, you know, like how do they stand it? I don't. And the amazing. other thing I say to them a lot is they will do their darndest to communicate with us. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's up to us to listen. And, and for example, I don't want to deal with a horse that rears. They scare me. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, particularly now as teaching, you know. But the horse that rears, I mean, we also have horses that grind their teeth or pin their ears or kick out or or stop dead when they get frustrated, whatever. Every horse, the way I look at it, finds a way to express his frustration. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the horse that rears has found a dangerous way to express his frustration. But mm-hmm. he's no worse horse than the one who pins his ears or kicks out or whatever. They've just found a different way to express their frustration. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think we've really got to try to listen to what they're trying to tell us. Yeah. Because most of them are very, very honest. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think horses lie. I don't think animals yeah. lie. And it takes, if we're going to be stewards of animals and, 
use them in this way, then we mm-hmm. have to be able to look at them and say, you are unhappy or unsuited to do this job that we're trying to make you do. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's pretty obvious if you look at horses that can't do <laughs> what mm-hmm. you're asking them to. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I think so many people want to look past that because either they've spent a lot of money on it or they've invested a lot of time into it or whatever the reason is. And giving up on a horse feels like a failure. But if you're not making them do what they're so unhappy doing, it's a gift for them to let them stop. I think that's so important. Yes. Yeah. And there there are those that, I mean, I had some dressage horses that just thought dressage was for the birds that ended up being wonderful jumpers. I've yeah. had the chicken jumpers that come and think being controlled like that, you know, you know where you're being controlled every stride is great, yeah. you know. And um, I've had those that should be trail horses, and I've had those that should be lawn ornaments. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. totally. but let's don't try to squash the square peg in the round hole or whatever it is totally what kind of knowledge do you share with parents and adult equestrians that's different from that that you've shared with kids well i think very often in my situation i run into parents who are getting into this and is it a good idea um they want to know, you know, they're looking at the long-term expense and is it worthwhile? Mm-hmm. Does a kid have any talent? And um, one, I mean, there's lots of answers to that, but one thing that that I tell them is riding should be a... Uh, it should take up a lot of your child's day. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, first of all, if they're really dedicated to it, they're going to let it take up parts of their day. And it sure beats some of the other things that those kids might be doing if they're not busy with their horse world. Yes. And I have to say, you know, as someone who grew up in the 50s and 60s, I am so glad I grew up then and not now with what these kids have to face um, uh, having nothing to do with the horse world, but, yeah, but same. everything else. I mean, it is, it's, it's tough out there. And, and I think the horse world is a really good world uh, overall, at least the one I know best, which is the dressage world um, for your, your kids to be into, mm-hmm. but they, you know, if you're, if you're going to make that, you as a parent are going to make that commitment um the child the rider has to show that it's it really is important to them yeah and you know i often have people ask me how young should they start when they start begging mm-hmm. <laughs> you know don't if if they if they're not begging to go to the stable then they don't need to go but uh if they're begging at age 3 or 4 maybe you can find the place that that'll get them going. Um, and then if they stop begging, then yeah. it's, and it's so hard nowadays because parents have their kids in 16 different activities. I'm <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and, um, you can't do riding the way I think you can do if you're serious about it, the way you, you can do other, well, I mean, anything you're going to do really seriously, you've got to put the time and energy into it, but For I think, sure riding you you know it's a year round if you're getting committed to a horse it's a year round activity you can't put put your horse in the closet for a few months um so they've really really got to want to do it yeah and uh then the other thing is i i try to explain because mommy i need a horse for young riders um or something um is as i i tried to express earlier a little bit Going to young riders, which is one of the big things in the dressage world, um, isn't the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And um, yes, it's a wonderful 
competition, team competition, all of that. It's wonderful, but it's not the be all that ends all. And um, they've got to want to ride for the love of riding. Right. And being around the horses. And being around the horses. Absolutely. Yeah. And as you were um, growing up in the industry, who did you look up to and who was there a mentor for you? Um, well, my idol and still is, was Hilda Gurney. Mm. And first of all, as I was just starting to learn about dressage and, and there she was on an American bred thoroughbred um, and received, she received all of her training in this country. She did train with a European, but, but um, uh, I thought she was amazing and it came even more so. I did a pony club clinic when I was still a teenager, probably late teenager, out in California. And there was Hilda Gurney, an Olympian, actually an Olympi- Olympic medalist, um, serving lunch. And I thought that was absolutely fabulous uh, <laughs> that uh, she hadn't put herself on a pedestal. And now here she is. I mean, she's got to be, I don't know how old she is, but she's older than I am. Mm-hmm. still riding and competing um and and uh you know i just love that boy she says what's on her mind and and uh, i think she's an, an amazing person yeah. um i grew up again pony club clinics maine uh no full-time instructor um just kind of went and looked at other people and then went home and tried to figure out how to do it bless you those horses that i had that put up with me trying <laughs> to figure out how to do it um and then when I received the horse, Beppo, who, um, uh, you know, became my, my first Olympic horse, uh, I put myself in the hands of Michael Poulin and um, moved back to Maine at that point uh, to work with him. And he's the only person with whom I worked any period of time. And he did miracles for me. He truly did. Um And even after I stopped riding with him, I mean, to this day, I could call him up and say, I'm having this problem with the horse. What do you suggest? So he's the one person that, that, uh, you know, really shaped uh, the beginning of my dressage career. Mm -hmm. And what do you consider the most successful parts of your career? I think what I'm doing now. Mm Mm-hmm. Helping kids. Um, I hope I'm doing a good job with it. Um, certainly, I've seen a lot of kids, particularly that were in the winter intensive training program, that have gone on to do so well. And that's really, really exciting. Yeah. I've taken everything that I learned as a rider and more and, you know, trying to pass it on, but definitely. Are there aspects? Um... When you work with the kids, it, for those who truly are aiming towards becoming professional riders, um, do you only focus on like the horses and the stable management and stuff, or do you also talk about how to run a business or how to own a business? Uh, informally, I talk about it, but but in the the well, even the two day clinics um, that that we do around the country. Um, there are two lectures every day. Okay. And in the winter and the summer programs, there's a lecture every day. And uh, granted, it's just, you know, an hour, hour and a half lecture. But I do, I make, a, I, I try very, very hard to introduce them to everything that I can, whether it's other way, other jobs you can have. We talked about earlier, other jobs you can have in the equestrian world and not be a, you know, running a stable or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, to stable management. I mean, every aspect we possibly can sports psychology, nutrition of horse, as well as nutrition of rider fitness, all of that. Um, we bring in, um, is it a full educational program? No, but at least it introduces them to it, to it. And they know it exists and they get some good education out of it. Not enough, but then it's a little bit up to them to to fill in the blanks. Yeah. I think um, we've talked about it with other people on the podcast. And um, 
you know, how many people just are kind of relying on the fact that they're a good rider or they can train horses, but they don't know how to keep books or they're yeah. not properly invoicing. And that's such a, a big part of if you're going to be successful is, you know, having those skills or finding a way to have somebody help you with those parts of it. I could be retired in Bali or Tahiti now if I had had some business management. And right. that is the thing I tell all the kids, get education in business management at the very least, mm -hmm. some marketing, some psychology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finances. Um, but they've got to learn how to run a business. Yeah. So important. And like you said of of you know you're you're also teaching or training people how to teach and how to be a good teacher but um maybe like how do you deal with clients and how do you oh, keep yeah. clients happy right cuz you know it's never just you out there unfortunately the that's the way i felt if i could just have the horses yeah, <laughs> people away. <laughs> deal with horses. I couldn't deal with people. Yeah, you've got to learn to do that for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and like you said, it's things are more difficult now, and there's, um, I think always people watching you, and yeah. and that sort of thing is something to learn as well and and how you present yourself publicly yeah. and um yeah I, there's just a lot of different aspects to it other than it's a lot the harder yeah and you have seen so much throughout your career and in, in different roles what do you hope for this industry going forward well at this point we just hope it's going to go forward that that mm -hmm. you know there's so much negative oh if we could just get rid of the internet um <laughs> right but on the one hand it's it's a little scary but on the other hand it's made people stand up and and really think about as you were saying how they're presenting themselves and mm -hmm. and um i think with with some of the um people that have been caught being cruel to horses that's made other people, I think, stop and think a little bit about, about what they're doing. So hopefully not just with the greater knowledge and the, and veterinary care and nutrition and all of that. Um, but um, the, the, the way people ride, hopefully that's going to continue, continue to improve. And I think, you know, you asked about, my sort of hero from way back um i'm i'm such a fan of of two people nowadays uh carl hester and ingrid klimka carl because he lets his horses be horses mm. you know when you see three of their top international horses galloping around the field together um that's fantastic and i i think his training system is great and i'm such a fan of ingrid who Again, you know, her dressage horses are galloping and jumping and doing cavaletti and as as well as being well trained. And I think the more we can prove that um uh that um is a good way for our horses to be. Mm -hmm. Um I hope that will continue to develop. Yeah. You can have that and still be competitive and exactly. At, at the high performance level and and horses being horses still. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, I just wanted to say, you know, you were one of our uh, guests at the 2019 summit that we had for equestrian business women. And Fascinating. yeah. And you've always supported us and reached out and, and offered a hand and, um, I just wanted to say thank you for that because it means a lot for us to have um, people like you that we can reach out to and 
ask questions and and uh, you're always there and always answering. Try so I appreciate be. it. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of each episode, we ask the same four questions to each guest oh. and Connor starts with the first one. What is one action that women can take to make a big difference in their lives? Don't let anybody get in your way. I like that. Is that good? Yeah, that's great. (laughs) And what's the best habit that keeps you motivated personally? Not letting the negative get in my way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And not dwelling on it. Uh, I just, I do what I love and um, I just do it. Yeah. Don't let anybody say I can't. <laughs> That's awesome. What's your favorite horse movie? That's a tough one. My, I think I have two. One is Hidalgo, but as I thought about it, I'm not sure if it was because of the horse or because of Vigo Mortensen. Yeah. <laughs> I could watch him in anything. Um, <laughs> so perhaps my favorite one was Spirit. I loved okay. that movie. <laughs> Loved his eyebrows. Yes. He he was so expressive. (laughs) And it was mostly a happy movie. I hate sad movies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. A few people have mentioned that they can't watch horse movies because there's usually some kind of trauma. Yeah. 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 And who would you recommend to be a future guest on this podcast? Um, I thought about that. I think about that. Um, I would be interested in someone not as old as I am, um, the ones that are young and getting into it, Mm. you know, what are they facing? Because they're facing things that are so different from what I went through. You know, someone Mm. in their 20s, late 20s, that's getting going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Love it. that, That I would find interesting. I think we can find some of those. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Definitely. Well, thanks so much again for taking the time. It was great talking to you and um, learning more. My pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you. For sure. Best of luck to you all. Thank Thank you. Hey, Equestrian B2B podcast listeners. Ready to level up your biz? Ride Every Stride specializes in tailoring brand identities for equestrian businesses. From logo development, essential stable accessories, and custom product branding to exclusive awards, VIP event must-haves, and chic apparel, they've got you covered. Visit RideEveryStride.com, use code B2B15, that's B2B15, at checkout for an exclusive 15% discount. Elevate your brand with Ride Every Stride, supporting women in business and equestrian excellence. That was a really incredible interview today. I loved talking to her. I was actually nervous in the beginning because I was like, oh my God, she's so famous. <laughs> she's so approachable though. And yes. Down to earth. And I will never forget when she stood up and asked that question at our 2019 summit with our keynote speaker and was like, I taught you. Do you remember? And <laughs> The like recognition that came up on Tracy's face. And yeah, it was. Yeah, I she's a cool woman. And I'm so glad we got to talk to her more about her life. I know. And I love how so well rounded she is in the industry and had all these different experiences and seen the industry grow and change and just that whole perspective and now she's giving back to the kids mm-hmm. um, is, is so amazing to me. And I, I think what really caught me in the beginning um, with the first question was her talking about not only like the cost, but like the loss of space, yes. of green space, because I, we don't think about that. We never talk about that, but that is mm-hmm. so true how like accessible it was when I was younger to have horses in your backyard. And now it's, it's a real thing to have to get the property to be able to do that. Right. Even just the zoning to be able to have uh, livestock. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's incredible. And, you know, I think back to, 
you know, the and, and going to shows and like local shows and local shows mm-hmm. now are so different than like local open shows. When I was growing up, there was English and Western and games and it went, you know, it was one day, it went all day. Um, they yeah. ran, you know, English in the mornings and then a lead line class and then switched to Western and Western pleasure and yeah. got all the jumps out of the ring. And, oh uh, yeah, like do games. And it was, um, it's so different now, right? Such specialization yes. in the industry. Yes, definitely. You know, when she was talking about that and you said you did the same and I look back and I was extremely specialized. I mean, all I did was hunter jumper. Uh, I had a few dressage lessons here and there, but uh, definitely that was my life was just that division or those divisions. So, um, but as I've gotten older and seen the different sports and ways to enjoy horses, I wish I had had more experiences with those. Yeah. I, I am so fortunate because I have, I've, I've gotten to ride saddle seat and I've ridden Western and I've done a little bit of reining. And I mean, I had a pony, we had Western saddles and English saddles and we had dressage saddles and we had uh harnesses and we drove our ponies and i mean we had a field full of nine ponies and we'd just grab one of them and do whatever we wanted whether (laughs) it was drive or jump a bunch of jumps or you know ride bareback trail ride the whole thing so yeah and and i don't even think about that anymore because my brain has shifted so much and listen i did a lot of that and it was really fun but once i got into that world where i was doing equitations and you know mm-hmm. we went to college and um it was really about like ring work and i'm so in that mode now like if i don't have something that i'm working on when i'm riding i almost don't enjoy it i'm like what is hacking around and i'm like yeah you know <laughs> cuz when you get it it's like such a shift but it's 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 um the green space thing really struck me because I was like, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that is something. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Um, the one thing that she said that I was like, Ooh, I've never, I, you kind of know it, but you never really think about is when she said that when she was riding at the top level, there were 12 people who could do like a grand prix test and, you know, now there's thousands Right. And um, they may not all do them well, but there's so many more people competing at the top level than there ever used to be. Yeah. And I've we've talked about it before. Like, I'm still shocked that the industry, just the hunter jumper industry can support like four big cir- winter circuits. No, five. One, two five big winter circuits in Florida in one state. Yes. Yep. And think of, yeah. And think about all successful. Yes. And think about rest across the rest of the country and, you know, it's staggering how many people are competing and you, and, but I do think a lot of them are taking that path of just riding horses because they want to compete and because they want to win yeah. And not because they want to learn how to be a horseman or how to train a horse or, and you know, that part of it. So it was interesting to talk to her about that. And, and she's been teaching kids for so long that what she has seen and, and how it's changed is, uh, I'm sure, a big difference than yeah. what it was when she started. And I love the fact that they that they are talking like a succession plan for the dressage for kids. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think that's so important. And that's such a hard thing for nonprofits is, you know, when the person whose vision it is isn't there anymore, how to make it go forward. I've I've been in, involved in a couple of nonprofits now. And I think that's something that we all struggle with is um, you know, how to how to keep it going when mm-hmm. that person with the vision and the drive for it and the passion for it isn't there anymore. So it's, I'm glad that they're thinking about that. Yeah. Cause what she provides is really incredible. And, you know, some of the kids that she brings along and, 
you know, I've seen them ride in Wellington and they've never been to a CDI before, you know, Mm -hmm. and, um, and what they get to experience through the opportunities that she gives them is really incredible. And she's had some kids come through that program that are now really, really top riders. And, um, well, I wrote a magazine article for World Equestrian Center about a, a dressage rider named Carrick and Gluck. She's actually the rider for Kim Van Campen, okay. um, who she mentioned helped mm-hmm. uh, uh, support dressage for kids and, and the youth riders. Um, but Kerrigan got the opportunity because she went to a Lyndon Gray clinic okay, and, and met Kim that way. And it yeah. was cool to hear that story of um, and how much, you know, Lendon did for her when she was a kid. Yeah, that's and awesome. Yeah. yeah, she's a very cool lady. And I'm yeah. glad we got to, uh, she got to tell us about what she does and um, her bio <laughs> was with the, I love the part generous, outspoken, and pragmatic. Those yeah. are awesome <laughs> descriptors. <laughs> yeah, she was great. It was it was awesome. And um more people that we get to talk to like that and and share uh is amazing. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna end the episode today with find the links to today's guests in the show notes at www.eqbusinesswomen.com. Equestrian B2B is out twice a month on the first and the fifteenth. You can find out more at eqbusinesswomen.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Find Equestrian B2B wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to follow, subscribe, and leave a review. You can have all 20 plus shows of the Horse Radio Network with you wherever you go with their free app for iPhone and Android. Go to your app store and search Horse Radio Network. Now, go give someone an opportunity. 